Welcome to the Rio Hondo College Gallery. Today's artist talk will be Jimmy Centeno, and we will be talking about his solo show. He has, and please go online and visit uh, riohondo.edu, and it will take you to a link to our gallery page, and we will share all those at the end. And we will have video and photos from both the show and in our um, smaller gallery, we will also have photos and video of the installation that Jimmy has done. So for this show, Somosur, um, let's start there. So From the Edges, will you talk a yeah. little bit about the title? Well, one? From the Edges, I th uh, it, uh, Robert, I, um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank the dean, the school, and the gallery. I mean, everybody that's you know, put this together. It's very beautiful, and I'm, you know, it's, thank you so much. Um, from the edges, uh, you know, I was sort of thinking about from the edges, you know, though uh, sort of like the edges are usually the margins and the margins are the ones probably sometimes list uh, where there's least attention. And I figured the edges would be something like that's kind of speaking to, to, to the center, let's say to the center of the mainstream or to the center of, you know, whatever is a status quo, uh, uh, the powers be. And it's always the edges, you know, that may, you know that are ignored, but at the same time, you know, are the ones that that, that rumble things to, to sort of make a make a statement in the, to the center. So that's where the idea from the edges comes, you know, the, the borders, the ends, sort of the, the the forgotten, or the ones that are that have a voice but are are not heard. Uh, there's no attention to that. So that's where edges comes from, you know, building on that. Yes. Now, Jimmy, you're an artist. You're a very well-known poet. You're a philosopher. You're an activist. You're a welder. You use mixed media. You use photography. You're using all these different things in your artwork. A little bit about your background, how you got into art, your education. Let's So our audience gets to know you a little better. Why don't you share a little bit about well, your life? Um, I am a, I'm a welder by trade. Um, I think the welding sort of uh, came by accident during high school. Um, I really wanted to take electronics and it was a year where the, the professor, the instructor had retired. So instead of getting electronics, I was put in welding in metal shop. And in metal shop, we had a very creative uh, instructor who, who, who did uh, jewelry, um, did uh, forged, I mean, he was doing gates, he was doing uh, very creative uh, ornamental uh, uh, fences and and many projects that involved you know very creative process, uh, Vern Oakleberry, and when I was plugged into that class and I saw that creative you know all that creative spirit and everything that I mean I, I, that really that really kind of that attracted me now. and so that sort of like was the start, especially seeing him do sort of these very creative projects with metal and welding, and I think that sort of kind of stayed, and then uh, as a welder myself then I began doing, you know, independent uh, projects, creative projects, and I did run into some folks that were very open and creative. I said, well, sort of like, well, what do you have? What, you know, what's your process? What are you thinking? What would you like? What do you see? So there's a collaboration. Um, I had many questions, especially philosophy. You know I mean? The, the book that I took from the high school library that I still have was a philosophy book that I really didn't understand. It was just, but nevertheless, the, when it was in it. And eventually with time, it didn't happen overnight, but with time, um, I started I started reading a little more on history, on um, Chicano history, Latin American history, um, indigenous history. And that sort of started kind of like building on, on, on my inquiry, building on the interest. And it wasn't until uh, uh, right after I had just finished uh, East LA College, and uh, I started um, sort of searching for a, let's say, a subject to, to, to study at Cal State LA. I originally was going to do political science, but when I saw Latin American studies and I saw all the different courses that were being offered, I mean, that in itself to me was like, this, is, this sounds very interesting. So I took uh, uh, classes and courses at Cal State LA, um, Latin American history, Latin American art, and uh, I was very fortunate to have some instructors that were very, uh, very um, passionate about, about, let's say, the art of Latin America or, you know, Chicano art. 
So that sort of began, I began sort of putting everything together, the philosophy, the trade, and, and um, the history. All that sort of just kind of came to, but it really was based on a, the fact that I was searching, the fact that I wanted to know more, I wanted to see, see something more than what I just, you know, just on the surface. And um, when, I, when I heard about the Latin American philosophy, that's something you really, I mean, I never really heard of Latin American philosophy. Uh, until I started the grad program and Latin American studies. Um, usually when you think of philosophy, you think of, you know, Aristotle, Plato, many of the Western European philosophers. But when, when Latin American philosophy came in, it was very different. And I did take a, one course with Professor Ricardo Gomez, who kind of laid it out and he said, um, well, philosophy, Latin American philosophy is literally like in Cien Años de Soledad, 100 Years of Solitude, in, my, in, you know, in Gabriel Garcia Marquez's book. That is Latin American philosophy. So then that triggered another, you know, that triggered another wave of questions and inquiry with literature and film. And that's when I started uh, paying more attention to what was being said by Latin American philosophers. And the whole question had to do with, is Latin American philosophy repeating um, Western philosophers, or is it searching for its own philosophy? And recently, uh, I think the discovery is that uh, Latin America is now, you know, it's always had its own philosophy, indigenous philosophy, Mesoamerican philosophy. And many great writers I had written about from the perspective of Latin American philosophy. Um, and um, that sort of began to say something more. It, it was now more in tune to, to let's say, to, to my history, to my background, to many questions I had and uh, sort of gave me a better understanding uh, of ideas and uh, sort of the big question when I think what I'm thinking, you know, why do I think um, what I'm thinking when I think? You know, so it's kind of dialectical process which kind of floated, came up, and uh, the arts played a big role, you know. You know, I had a very, cre very creative uh, mother. Uh, she was a seamstress. She did her own uh, curtains, her own um, pillow covers, um, I mean, just about all of that. I'm very, I mean, with, with different kind of buttons. So that was, I was very intrigued. And she was very, also very curious about, about um, souvenirs and, and had them all around the house. That was always questions. For example, I had, mother had bought um, sort of this, this kind of like a bowl, hollow in the center, and it was sort of held by three elephants. And the longest question I had, and, and I always pondered about it, that it was very dark brown and shiny. And I always said, well, I mean, like, what is it? But it wasn't until years after when I found that it was actually a coconut, very polished coconut, with, you know, with uh, some inscribed uh, design and, and hollow in the center with three elephants. So all of that was all these questions. I mean, it was, it was always looking at and making that observation and, and asking, like, how was it made? What does it mean? And so I think subconsciously all those, all of that kind of played a role. But in the more latter years of the education and more latter years of, of art as I began to study it, then I figured, you know, um, this was, you know, something that I really liked. How is it that art can be very poetic? Art can also have a lot of meaning. Now, when you went, you finished your bachelor's yeah, degree yeah. and then you went back again. Yes. Um, and wanted to get your master's yes, degree. Yes. You chose to go to the same school yes. for both. Um, were you taking mostly philosophy classes? Did you start taking art classes? I know you've talked to me in the past about, I've taken history, I've taken a lot of, you were into philosophy. Mm -hmm. Did you actually take at that time any art courses? Well, I think the art was much more on the, on the history aspect of art. And the art, um, in terms of building in the creating process, I think a lot of that sort of was intuitive in terms of what is it that attracted me the most from, you know, a wi wide range of artists that I had been exposed to, um, African aesthetics, Mesoamerican aesthetics, um, um, David Smith, the American, you know, uh, sculptor. Um, Julio Gonzalez from Spain, you know, uh, and collaborating with, you know, with other artists in Europe. Um, and seeing that, that you can actually build something out of, out of, you know, metal, and it was the same technique I was using for a living. 
Um, that's how a startup came about. And plus, as a, as a welder and trade, there was already exposed to, to, to that aspect. But the thing is that you don't consider yourself an artist. See, that's, that's the thing. You're a welder and you create these beautiful fences or something very creative and beautiful and different. But the artist label or title wasn't really something you would consider. You, that was not part of it until, um, you know, when someone would say, well, I think, you know, you're an artist. And it kind of sort of, you know, started, well, okay. But um, the art aspect and the practice was mainly at, at sort of uh, the shop, which I call today, they call it studios. Uh, I would, I'll continue to call my little small place a shop. And that's where it began, you know, sort of like just putting things together and pieces around in the bench and things. And there, there is a big talk among artists and art schools and collectors and I always find it fascinating which route some people went like the class I'm classically trained from here versus real life training you you went into more philosophy and history which really feeds the right. ideas Correct. and the soul and then you know having that skill from your day training that's one of the things I loved about your work that you're bringing in this high level of skill that you can only have by doing it so much. And people forget that there's a lot of times we come out of school and it's like, I have all these great ideas, but I don't know how to make anything. Right. And it's, it's so nice and refreshing that it, there isn't just one path. And that's one of the things I'd love about having you here as an artist is it's important for people to realize there are so many paths to becoming an artist. And I believe a dear friend of yours, Eloy Torres, I think. Right. You know, and I think he was talking on one of our panels from Riverside. And, you know, he grew up thinking like, I'm gonna, you know, a house painter at one time. Mm -hmm. And here he's one of the great LA muralists and right. one, of, one of my favorite artists. But, you know, he took that, that sort of trade yeah. and it's what he did with it, same thing, which, you did with your raw skill and talent and having that I don't know if it's you that you discovered on your own and you could answer this or having that influence from the university that helped you with the ideas and so being able to put it together to make really brilliant and exciting art. Well, well Robert I think I think um, I think it's a combination of, of many things for some you know uh, I think uh, was it Edward Weston was also, um, I think he had like a day job and then he was at photography and uh, that's how he was able to sustain, you know, himself, you know, his, his passion and his, you know, his career as a photographer. And I'm sure there's many artists too that have gone through that process, but I think it's an important process because when you're out there actually um, day in, day out and um, merging with, with, the, with the material and the steel and the environment, I think it, and then you meet, then you meet, you meet, you're in different scenarios and you meet different people with different stories and you might even see just a wall that just kind of like, I would like, you know, that's peeling that you would want to paint on a canvas. All of that feeds into it. So there's, let's say a praxis, let's say sort of on hands kind of experience, a raw experience, let's say, if you would call that, you know, where you're actually, um, you know, practicing uh, a trade, uh, but, that is what allows you in terms of time, in terms of like, expressing what you have, the idea that you have, and by being out there, by actually doing it, you know, all these it's and bits of experience that sort of tap you at a moment when you, ah, okay, this is what I've been looking for to, to say this. So yes, I mean, all these it's and bits of experiences, I mean, like Eloy, I just mentioned, you know, being a, a painter. A house painter and I mean he's, he's, he's wonderful with his work and many more but I think that's probably uh, something I encourage I encourage if you know if you're a painter probably you know go out and help out and paint some homes or something you know and and maybe there's a conversation that's taking place whether it's with the structure whether it's the way the paint merges or the way it makes you feel and I think th th that it's gonna really add to 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 the emotion of the work you produce, the poetic aspect, the political aspect, the social and cultural uh, 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 diversity of, of colors or, or shapes and conversation, you know, it all, it all, that's, that's, that's something to think about and to consider too. Um, for steel, as you see, some of the steel is, 
you know, uh, it's, it's the rust and the long walk that I'm taking maybe by the railroad. And as you're walking, you're also that moment of silence, you're meditating. But at the same time, you know, you see the, you see the pieces that have, for me, that have already, that have already engaged with the elements. And they have a conversation as is with, you know, the whole rust and oxidization and the shape. So that's a conversation that I really like to have with the, with well, the work. I want to ask you, and you are using a little bit about, in a, like the one piece, right behind you, which has a, a touch of polish. You are using sort of, it looks, you know, the rusty metal as paint, as a patina, right? right? right. Because rust is, in a sense, in a sense, it's patina, it's aging, and has this beautiful quality. But it also does, um, it limits the life of the piece, too. So many artists are there trying to protect the work and code it, and that yeah. everything ages in that. You've sort of embraced that sort yeah. of the natural quality um a little bit about yeah that. well well for example um we have this piece here and every time i move it around the the plate the bottom base is very thin so every time i move it around little pieces of the of rust come off of the plate so it's thinning in the process i think i think i'm okay with that you know i'm okay with the fact that it that it's aging and rusting and it's a uh, let's say a thin layer that weathers away I'm okay with that because I think it's also the fact that that's what life is about, right? You know, uh, knowing that reality that, you know, of weathering, right, of coming, being, and going. So part of that here too, like the wood pieces, you know, too, and, and a, a lot of that. So the rust is that conversation, you know, it's kind of, kind of like the weathering of life and, and the cycles that come and go. Well, as it patinas more too, you get more color depth and there's a certain beauty to that. Now I notice you're using some um, basic shapes in your work. You can see behind me, I see a lot of keys, sort of almost this cog shape that sort of flows throughout your work. Um, can you talk a little bit about the significance of some of the shapes and maybe the origins of where it comes yeah. from and what it means to you? Um, uh, the shape is sort of like, I like to sort of think um, like a Stella like, you know, or, or some of the African sculptures. Um, and um, I'm very fascinated by that, the en elongated shape and how they speak, um, the wood that, that is used, or example, the stellas and the history that's, 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 in the st that's built into the stella, you know, the, the Mayan stellas. Um, the keys, I, I think the keys sort of, you know, the keys are sort of like, you know, use the key to open, so open something up, close, so it's kind of like a key to, Open history, uh, you know, close something and it opens your heart, it, it closes your heart. And I like to sort of think about keys as always being like a special combination um, to open. Um, so like the, the piece at the end, um, that's a piece that I've dedicated to Ingudi Wathiongo, a story, Matigari. Um, and in this story, Matigari becomes sort of like the keeper of memory. And so the keys, each key is like, it opens up a memory. Each stage of Matigari throughout the book, is a, each chapter, each two pages or so, opens up a key to something. And it allows you to see, allows you to breathe, you know, what you're reading and, and feel, feel the emotion. And also know that as a keeper of memory, how important memory is. So keys are important. Keys, uh, keys play a role in terms sort of like, uh, that allow you to open or even close, but mainly to open, open combinations in, in themselves, you know, unique in themselves. So I kind of have a, when I have a lot of keys, I have one piece that's not in the show, but um, it's sort of like many keys are suspended and I was thinking about it. I said like it takes many keys to open one lock, you know, like many keys, many combinations to open the lock in the, in the hands of one person. So we all look at ourselves as keys with different combinations and different experiences and different patinas. As, as a combination, uh, all of us, despite, you know, despite, uh, let's say, despite the combination, you know, we, we can, we can, we, we're, it's possible to, to open that lock that, that someone has gripped in their hand. So I, I like that. Despite, you would think that one key is not enough. But the way I want to perceive it is that it takes many keys with different combinations to open one lock 
in the hands of one person. So I kind of I kind of see I see it that way in the role of keys, and and also uh, uh, um, um, keys that are very distinct and probably no longer in use as as the sculpture right be, be, right next to you. It's sort of like a very unique small key. Maybe it opened up a small lock, um, but yeah, that's what the role of keys. And plus, as as a welder, you know, I, I get the chance. I mean, I'm always either changing locks or removing gates, and there's always all these keys left. So I said, you know, I, I save them. I, I think eventually, you know, and they ring. They have a ring to them. So that's why I, 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 I really uh, am fascinated about keys and, and the use of keys in, in, in the sculptures. And um, it has a ring. I find it so interesting because when we talked and talked before the show and during, you mentioned a lot about the Latino culture and the African culture, and they both have such, at least to me, such a strong underlying spiritual quality to it. Right. Um, is that a lot of that that's in your yes. work, sort of the tie between, obviously, there's a big culture. Right now in the art world, it's an interesting thing where people are touchy, oh, you know, how can you, you know, sort of relate to the African culture? being Hispanic or vice versa, like how could you? And I always find interesting ties because I always find there are cross barriers between mm -hmm. if we look. And I just was curious how you felt well, with. Well, uh, Robert, I, th I, think, I think it is true. I think there's a lot of similarities in terms of um, the creation of, of their aesthetics, the art and culture. And you have cultures that have been expressing themselves um, actually through, let's say, through nature, let's say, right? When nature was not yet an object, and nature actually was a, 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 some kind of a living entity, you know, living. Uh, and that runs across many cultures. It runs across Mesoamerican culture, uh, Latin American culture, uh, the belief that, uh, that Earth uh, uh, is actually not an object but a subject. And the same thing with, with many other, with Africa as well. That's why the role of, of Earth and the role and how it was, how it was looked at, worshipped, admired, played an important role. So African cultures had a very important role in, in worshipping the sun and seeing it as actually something, not as an object, but actually something that's subject. Uh, trees and things like that. So there's a lot of, I mean, Latin America as well. Also, and, and um, pre-cultures, let's say, and, um, and prior, to, prior to, to colonization, um, had that belief. That sort of shifted right after colonization uh, in terms of, you know, a tree is an object and to, to be made into something, right? It's no longer uh, the way it was perceived before, maybe as, as, as a grandfather or as a cousin or something like that. But yes, it is important. There has to, I, I believe that the art should have some spirit. It should have something. It should be an extension of, of what you feel and how you see. That should also be expressed, expressed in the art, artwork and the art. So that I, I, it's important for me to, to have that spirit. And it's important to connect, always be connecting cultures together because there's a lot of similarities. Um, sometimes there's an idea that that's not true. But I think when we pause and we begin to make the, you know, begin to look at it much more and begin to sort of cross-reference, you'll see a lot of, a lot of, a lot of similarities, a, a lot of likeness in, in the spirituality. Yes. Um, now, with some of your work, you obviously are an accomplished welder, and we could see that as well, and, you know, have this great art, artistic sense. You've also branched out. A lot of your work is mixed media. You're doing a lot of collage, a lot of, you're including photographs, you're sort of crossing these barriers. How did you sort of jump into other mediums? Um, I guess, you know, that comes when like, you, you visit the museums and, you know, you, you look at other, you're influenced by other artists as well, and you like what they're doing with their work, with the collage work, with photography. And then you also get to see the, the language they're using to express themselves, you know, um, the um, be a photography and sort of in a in a collage or things, and I and I you know that kind of was that that was appealing that was attractive, and I said well, I would like to experiment and try that. I would like to not just do sculpture, but I would also like to sort of 
um, use old paper, um, use an image, incorporate, and you know, g give it that same theme, give it that same meaning that I search for, but at the same time through a different medium. And uh, the, people yeah. have to understand that's not an easy thing to do. Like your collage is done excellent. I mean, they're well thought out, they're well executed. It's not. It's like. To say, oh, I just I'm going to create these beautiful collages, or I'm going to, um, you know, start incorporating photos. Unless you're using stock photos that you're taking from somebody, that's a skill. I mean, and then turning it into an art form is a whole different thing. And so, doing that is mm -hmm. especially whether I was curious whether you were self-taught, whether you just went and researched it, whether you went back to school. Well, I would say I would say self-taught. I would say self-taught. You know, I, I I didn't go to a class, let's say, to do the collages and you know, use the symmetry or, or you know, or how to compose the language. That was self-taught. But again, it had to do a lot with you know, um, having that conversation with your material. I think artists have that conversation, and maybe that should be a a, a conversation of you know to to think about. But yes, I think self-taught. I was. You know, curious to see how is it that I can, you know, use some uh, pages of a book, you know, in, in, in a collage. How can I make it work? So um, it's a lot experimental, but um, a lot of the work you see here um, uh, is self-taught in the sense, with the exception of the, of the welding skill, you know, at high school and then going off and, and uh, you know, reinforcing it more in the trade. But... Um, like the like the black mirror piece there that you see across that piece there is it's an all wood wood it's a wood collage, and it's made up of a veneer uh, from furniture that you find in the street that's peeling, and you know I I, I just say well how how about if I just start to glue these pieces, and um, but you know that that sort of just comes again um, when Joaquin Garcia Torres. Um, had done some, had done, you know, had done in the 40s. He comes back from Europe, he goes back to Uruguay, that's where he, you know, that's his origin. And in, when he's there, he begins to see the oil paint in canvases was very expensive back in the 1940s in, in Uruguay. And so he begins to think, well, why don't we use what we can? And so in his workshops, he would sort of um, uh, uh, request will bring whatever you you can find whether it's an old wood or whatever and we'll, and we'll make use of it and so but he had an, he had sort of like this really thought out language and the thought out language meant poetic meant um, um, sentiments emotions and uh, uh, some history something that you want something meaningful let's say that you would like to share and that's what he that's what he uh, he encouraged, you know, the students to just bring whatever you find, engage in the conversation, and and continue it. And and you know that 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 was also that was also very inspiring too for a self-taught artist to all of a sudden see uh, you know maybe a draw an old drawer that just thrown out in the streets, and then you know uh, make that reference to you know to Torres Garcia and think well, I think I think this can work. And then you you know that's when you begin the process. But yes, I think uh, I think just the thing is that there's actually um, items and objects that really have a that are really out in the street that have have a very interesting can have an interesting conversation can be you know really you can really build on that. So that's sort of you know I would say sort of like you know the origin the self-taught and then reading up on some of the artists and how they felt about their art and the process. That was also okay, and it just you think about it. Well, going with that, what do you want people to feel about your work? I mean, you've been working at this so hard. I mean, you're very pro. You're a dedicated artist. About how many pieces? Just to, it's a great, I great for young artists that are out there to learn. But how many do you make a year? I mean, obviously we have quite a bit in the show. Please go online take a look at the video and the images. It's, it's really incredible with the amount of work you've made and your dedication to your practice. What, is there, do you set yourself, you know, sort of on the technical side, 
we just had a show with Eve Wood, and she says, I need, she's like, at one time I did a drawing a day, and then it wasn't, or a painting a day, then it wasn't practical. So I started to, you know, at some stage do one a week. Is, do you set goals for yourself, like I want, or does it just sort of, like that needs to be a sculpture? How do you find the time between work and studio practice? Well, let's say in terms of the studio practice, um, I think sort of setting a goal is, I think it's important, but I, but that's sort of not the way, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm inspired or I, I begin the process, but what I do, what I do is that I would, you know, sort of maybe have a, a series of, uh, of, of steel, again, certain safe, certain, but certain, there's a certain conversation taking place. And while I'm working, I'm having that conversation with the material. I'm having a conversation with, with ideas. It's back and forth. Um, and then sometimes all it takes is just one egg, one piece that all of a sudden just pops out and, and, it, and, it, and becomes, it, it sort of encourages to, to, build, to build a piece. But yes, I, I, I try to sort of maybe, uh, let's say, on, the sculpt, on these uh, sculpture pieces, I try at least to do at least maybe two, two a month. I don't really want to force the conversation. I don't want to force it. And the thing about it is that you can always take it apart, but I don't really want to force a conversation. Like the, the, the black mirror piece there, that was, that conversation was taking place since 2019, 2019, uh, 2020. And um, it was almost like perfect timing for the show and it was completed, you know, for the show. But the conversation that started in 2019 and, you know, gluing bits a veneer, one day yes, or, or, or a several on, in one week, and, and just like that. So some of these pieces probably have took maybe one year or so. Um, not that I didn't have the material, but what I wanted, perhaps, you know, to express, uh, might have taken a year or so, six months. And in that process, there's other pieces that really inspire and you're able to produce much quicker than one of this piece here, let's say. But yeah, uh, there's, there is some sort of, let's say, discipline, and I think some goal as well um, uh, in terms of um, producing, producing the artwork. Yes, uh, it's important, I think, too, to so maybe set a goal, but not force the goal too much, because if you feel you're forcing yourself and you feel, then you, I think that's when it's te the, it's telling you to step back a bit, and which you can be doing something else. Uh, you know, I, can be working, I can be working on the, on the collage piece while I'm working on this one. This, piece here probably say, I felt it was being too forced that I pause and I go on with the collage so I think that there's certain pieces that allow you to work day in day out after work let's say glue another sheet of paper or another veneer and then at the same time this piece here is waiting and you can come back to it while you're working on this so it's like almost like multi I don't know, multitasking there's multi conversations but you're active not necessarily producing one scoop, one sculpture a month, let's say, but you are working on a collage, you are working on, a, on some paintings, and then you come back to this one, sort of, you know, rotating. I think that's sort of like all the pieces kind of feed each other and support each other. And that's how that's how you're able sometimes, at least for me, I'm able to get that come, you know, get that conversation with the piece and weld it, and all of a sudden say, okay, it's done. I feel comfortable with it. You know. Now Feeding on that a little bit now, especially being, you know, so entrenched in the philosophy world, you've created organizations, you know, pioneered, you know, s sort of in the Latino field on sort of this Latino philosophy kind of culture. Do you get inspired like, oh my God, this book I read or this discussion we had and this topic, I need to go almost in reverse and create work dealing with that or do you let the work flow a little bit how much does your other life sort of creep back in well yeah yeah i think let's say for example no one philosophy you, you know you, you read let's say an essay or a philosophy book and what they're addressing um that really that really sort of encourages you to 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 say okay well the book is saying this how, how can i you know this is how i feel about what i just read and how is it that I how is it that I can share this share what I just read, in, in let's say in in a sculpture or in a collage? So yes, 
It does. It does impact, and it does. You, you have that conversation. There's something about the book that just keeps calling you. Uh, uh, it's uh, and that in itself, it works its way through your artwork, and and it shapes it, and it gives it gives it it gives it shape. It gives it form. But yes, um, I'll, I'll, what you read, uh, especially if that's that's what that's what. Uh, is your interest in it will shape it, and the philosophy does shape. I mean, when we talk about um, Somosur, I mean, which is sort of like the, the second title of, of, of the show, is Somosur, we are South. And from the Global South perspective, there's a whole philosophy that's taking place that's, let's say, rare, little known here in the States. And for example, we have in the back, sort of like around the corner, we have uh, the Globe, uh, with the barbecue grill on top, sort of like a barbecue pit, and it, and it's it's a globe, and that's the globe is sort of Somosur. We are the South, and so that conversation comes about, you know, uh, the concern for the global South and its resources. So this is this comes through through some of the, the, the readings and essays and some of the the questions and some of sort of like say uh, the protest. You know, you have the global North consuming the global South, the resources that are mostly concentrated in the global South where it's wood, where it's um, lithium, whether it's uh, oil, you know. So I'm trying to sort of say this conversation, you know, like the global north uh, um, and the global south need to have a better conversation in terms of resources, especially when it comes to environment, where we're at. And the fact that you have the global countries in the global that all they do is, pro, you know, providers of our resources um, and regardless, in the, you know, poverty, and things like that. So that's the conversation I was having. I said, how is it that I can have this conversation? And so when I'm driving down the street, I so happen to see a bag with a, you no, know, like a big plastic bag. And in the middle, I said, get off. And I find out it's, a, it's two spheres, you know, two, a globe, like in half. And I said, well, and I said, oh, no, this is a conversation right here. But because I've, I've already sort of been reading and sort of, you know, pondering a lot of these questions and the concerns. And it's been the, the, the political, that's the political aspect, the cultural aspect, you know, between the global north and global south. There needs a better conversation, a more understanding of what the global south is really asking and what it really wants. I mean, it, it, it wants to be able to, to preserve its natural resources. And not just that, but also not no longer depend on its own natural resources to be able to sustain its, its country, to sustain its people and continue developing, you know, uh, progress uh, in a very linear way, which requires the consumption and probably, you know, the deforestation. And so how do you develop when you got to destroy your forest? And that's the only means you have. And that is what it is most seeked by, let's say, a rich nation up in the global north. So what do you do? So these are the questions that I, that, that, that I think some of the artwork can reflect and ask. It, you know, so it, yeah, it is. Now, <clears throat> sort of on the lines. We happened, there's been a tremendous turmoil this year and with all the politics and having COVID. And that's affected a lot of artists. And it's hard to do these interviews. I hate to, you know, sort of get into that. But it's, it is, I think it is important, like how politics or how COVID has, you know, we've isolated ourselves, mm -hmm. even here just until the last few minutes before the interview, we're all masked up, making sure we have proper distance for this mm -hmm. and the doors are open and ventilation. And I, I, matter of fact, when you took off your mask, it was the first time I saw, <laughs> you know, all the conversation, first yeah. time I saw your face, yeah. really. Yeah. You know, so we've sort of lost sort of yeah. that connection of touching people, of welcoming yeah. people. Um, there's a lot of people are suffering. They're, they're lonely. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, it affects their practice. They haven't seen family. And it, it's changed people's art dramatically mm -hmm. and their lives. How has that affected your work? Has it affected your work and your practice? Well, I, I, um, I think it has. I think it's at least um, it's um, given me sort of um, time to reflect more on what is it that I want to say. Especially, you know, given the urg urgency that you know that that we uh, are living, you know, that uh, with COVID nineteen, that's that's a concern, and it sort of brings me to like, you know, we've somehow 
this part of the spirituality sort of kind of deviated and now perhaps maybe we sort of see ourselves a, we were isolated at a time but we were so busy to acknowledge that we were let's say we, we you know, were isolated or, or we're alone let's say but now it really kind of sort of it's there and I think this has really sort of amplified what may, perhaps what was already there let's say um, in terms of the practices, well, I think it, it, it yes, I think it's a, perhaps a, a great moment or an opportunity, let's say, to, you know, to really um, work on projects that you had in mind and, and reflect at the same time in that process. Um, what does it mean, you know, today, you know, for humanity, you know, uh, with this pandemic? You know, how can we move forward? How can art be a function? How can art be therapy? How can art cure, um, you know, questions that you have? internal and external questions in relation to you and your community. So there's, a, yes, there, I think it's, it's important. And for myself, like I said, I think it's, it's allowed me to sort of uh, be more reflective of my community. It's allowed me to sort of tap into, you know, uh, sort of we're all in it together kind of thing. And, uh, and actually try to be uh, more conscious of that and be more aware of, of assisting someone. Despite today, I mean, you, don't, you really don't want, you know, you're concerned about assisting someone, but I think it's important to sort of go back to, 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 to the basics. You know, uh, I think it got lost on the way, and I think with, with, with the pandemic, I think uh, you can see it. You know, artists usually, you know, paint in their studios, in their studios, let's say, and now it's like, you know, it, you even feel more isolated, more detached from your from community. So I think now it's time to reflect on everything that's been around you. That's always been there. Always, you know, always, it's always been there. It's always played a role. And I hope that out of this we can really uh, uh, now feel more sense of, of belonging, you know. So, yes, it, it, it does, it has made an impact in terms of how I feel about what's going on. And the fact that, again, going back to the Global South, the disparity between those who have access to, to the vaccine in the Global North compared to, to the Global South, that's, it's, that's already a fact. So this, again, it, it's like Global North, as the richest nations have access and the global south is struggling to have access to the vaccine you know so uh, that's a conversation again that we need to have the disparities i mean this is this has a lot it's structured i would say i don't i don't see it as as something that's just uh, it's a coincidence this is actually something that is very structured and sort of shaped that way and hopefully uh hopefully we can see it Hopefully the information is out there, the conversation that we're having is out there too as well. So part of, part of everything we see here, part of now being, you know, confined to your home, um, to your studio, um, is to think about these things and to acknowledge that. Because I, I believe, you know, I mean, there's you as an artist, you have, you have a special connection uh, with things that, let's say, a politician might not have let's say an uh, um, architect might not have. So as an artist, I think it's, you're, you're more in tune to, to, to other things. And it's important to, to acknowledge and realize that and have that conversation, like the one we're having right here with, in terms of what is it, you know, Somos Sur and Desde Las Orillas. Now we're just about at the end of time. Now we had a, you had mm -hmm. a collector come, and <clears throat> if there's a couple of questions out there, um, I, I did get a question in advance, and I, I promised to cover this. So I, I, we already had a question, okay. and I, I promised to ask. So um, number four and five on our show, uh, The Rise and Fall, um, which are these two metal sculptures, beautiful, that for those of you who can't see them, some of you may be able to pop them up, are uh, still kind of rectangles with railroad ties. Yes. Aren't they railroad yes. ties? And, you know, the title's so interesting, and the sculptures are really lovely and quite interesting. And they wanted to know about the title and what was behind the sculptures a little bit. Well, you know. arrows, life, love, you know, I think um, there's sort of like a, a moment where, again, we sort of maybe didn't, you know, didn't really acknowledge life and love and everything that comes, you know, like the pursuit of life. You know, we're in the pursuit of goods and materials and status versus the pursuit of life, you know, everything that adds to it. 
So uh, Aero is a sort of like um, it's a it's a it's it's heavy as you can see. It's 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 railroad ties is all inverted, you know, inward in terms of the soul, the heart. Uh, sort of uh, acknowledging probably the the most important aspect of of humanity is the fact that we have this we have this idea of love eros of life something uh, that, that no other creature can perceive and we have that and i think we should nurture it acknowledge it and so that's why it was it's a heavy piece because that's a that's a heavy sentence it's a heavy exclamation in terms of eros life um and and the pursuit not of happiness because happiness can mean different different things to many people, but the pursuit of life, everything that adds to it. Um, and the rise of ego is, you know, we're, we're in a society where the ego seems to have sort of all of a sudden amplified itself. It's like, it's, it's subdued um, life, eros, love, uh, for really very individualistic, very self-satisfying, self-serving. Uh, moment in history and culture that we live, you know, and as you can see, the the railroad ties are sort of going outward, and there's a selfless a sort of I'd say a, not selflessness, um, but sort of um, um, unconscious of what you do and what it means to someone else, very self-centered, sort of egoistic, and the harm that that might imply or the discomfort that that can come about. So that's why the nails kind of paint outward, and it's I sort of like it's true. It's it's like it's an unbalanced moment. We've got we've got a a very unhealthy um, rise of ego and 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 very disbalanced arrows of life and love. And I think Martin Luther King said, you know, it's it's important to have to have a healthy ego, a healthy eye to be conscious, because when you have one that's unhealthy, then it's it's everything is about. My, myself, everything's about I and, and everything rotates around I and nothing else. I know we're out of time and I want to thank our Dean Grant who sets up these amazing studios for us and Wendy and Abby and the you know administrators at Rio Hondo who allow this to go on yeah. during this time, especially you Jimmy for bringing, you know, making the show happen and being here for this event. Um, on that note, um, for people to find out more about you, uh, website, Instagram, is there, this is what we will be yeah. posting everything online as soon as we get. Well, I don't have a website. I don't use Instagram, so I'm, just, I'm, st I'm working on that. I've been working on that, I think, for the past couple of years. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping. I think maybe my email, if they have some questions, I think that's probably, that's you know. That's perfect. we we'll give a shout out yeah, for your. That's one way to start, you know, an exchange and conversation. But I do hope, you know, soon, you know, to have some social media, you know, uh, apparatus, let's say, to be able to communicate and people can see and, and, uh, and uh, tune in, let's say. Well, these videos will be available on the Rio Hondo site, on my site, we'll have them on YouTube. So when you Google Jimmy, you'll see all his work come up. And we will be sharing both the video and all the images with you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming and joining us. And thank, thank you, Jimmy, you. No, for thank this you. great talk. And thank you to the, everyone else that's out there, you know, viewing. Thank you very much. Gracias.